Good morning. Good morning. I want to thank my church family for all they have done for me in the past three months. It's been a long, long journey for me, but with the help of my family, my church family, and friends, I've been able to get through it. You never know what kind of impact you're going to have on people. And so my real message to you today is to be thankful in all things and to remember those around you and always have a smile for them. God is so good and you just don't know what a smile will do for somebody in each day. So thank you again for all the many, many kindnesses things that you have done for me. It will not go, um, I lost my word, that's not, not easy for me. But anyway, <laughs> I will always remember what you have done. So God bless each one of you. And just take care of each other. Well, I have a few minor announcements. Uh, today is a workshop at 2 o'clock. And that's to prepare for the November 18th holiday market, which is only four weeks away. Not even that, actually. So we need a lot of hands on board. If you haven't done it before, come on by and help out. You don't have to know what to do, I'm sure we'll find something. Okay. Uh, the next choir practice is right after church today, before the uh, workshop. Food for Body and Spirit is Wednesday at 6 o'clock, and we're having chili and fixings, like cornbread and uh, especially desserts, so bring something there. And speaking of food, we've got the Freedom's Hope Drive going on right now, so out in the lobby there's baskets to bring food and some other supplies to help out Freedom's Hope. Ed is on vacation today, just like last week, but he, we recorded his talents on video and audio for this morning, like we did last week. So he'll be with us today in spirit and up here. So now let us open our hearts and minds. Oh, one more thing. Sorry. On November 19th, is that a Saturday? No, Sunday. 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 Yeah, Sunday. We're having a joint Thanksgiving service here with Bethany. And we will be doing the cooking, but it's not a, it's not a meal after the service. It's only going to be finger foods. So we'll have a service here, and afterwards we'll just gather around with a few little things on the table. That's November 19th. Now let us open our hearts and minds for worship.
service, worship then with the prayer. Eternal God, we long for truths that are lasting, yet we want our faith to be alive to the people and problems of today. As we move forward in an ever-changing world, may faith in Christ be our anchor, and your love be our guide through the presence and power of the Spirit. Unite our hearts even as we unite our voices in your praise. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Would you join me please in our call to worship? Though there are rulers, presidents, kings, queens, God is the Lord of all life. In God we live and move and have our being. God requires our faithfulness and our service. We reach out to others with the same kind of love with which God has touched our lives. Come, let us worship the Lord who is always with us. Let us praise God who walks daily by our side. Amen. Let us celebrate together and sing praise to God in the names of
Consider, too, that this nation is your people. He said, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. And he said to him, If your presence will not go, do not carry us up from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people, unless you go with us? In this way, we shall be distinct, I and your people, from every people on the face of the earth. The Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing that you have asked, for you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. Moses said, Show me your glory, I pray. And the Lord said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and will proclaim before you the name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But, he said, you cannot see my face, for no one shall see me and live. And the Lord continued, See, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock. And while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand, until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. The word of God for the people of God. Amen. Thanks be to God. Our hymn of worship, I Surrender All.
Will you pray with me? Most holy and gracious Father, we gather here to sing your praises and worship you. You are our God and we are your people, sons and daughters living by your word in the kingdom of earth. As we gather together in your presence, we thank you for rescuing us from a life without hope, a life given to us by the sacrifice of your Son, a life where we are born of the Spirit, filled with the Spirit, and led by the Spirit. Thank you for believers that gather in your name to learn your way, to glorify you in name and action, to spread the love and joy received from you to others. Thank you for your mercy and forgiveness, for grace that is freely given, and for healing of body and spirit. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we know you hear every prayer, and that by asking you, your will is done. You already know what we need, and we thank you for the healing and restoration seen here at Shiloh, and with connections to Shiloh on our prayer list. We continue to pray for Barbara, Mike and Carolyn, David, Sam and Ellen, Johnny's family, Billy and Gina, and for little Adeline Bustle of Teresa's family and her sisters having mouth surgery. We continue to pray for all those we name in our hearts and Keep them in your care. We pray for our leaders and leaders of other countries to come to the table for peace and for the homeless and hungry, victims of violence and war. We thank you for the abundance that helps us find the resources to help those in need and show your love and care. We thank you for the return of hostages and we pray for those still in captivity. Bring them, bring, excuse me, bring help to them and protect them as their lives are restored. We pray that we can reach people that are dying of neglect, living in poverty, full of despair and hopelessness. We pray for victims of natural disaster, hurricanes, and earthquakes. Let us send all we can to meet the need. Lord, in your mercy. Let us volunteer to give of ourselves in helping others and be seen in serving God in whatever we do in your name. Let us care for each other, pray for each other, love each other, and love and serve our Lord. We pray for our church, our pastor, and our session. We pray for our families and for our neighbors and friends. We pray that we can be your hands in our place that you have chosen for us and spread the good news to all around us. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now join me in the reading of the Apostles' Creed. And this is the book. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father. From there he will come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of everlasting. 
So they sent their disciples to him, along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are sincere and teach the way of God in accordance with truth and show deference to no one. For you do not regard people with partiality. Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why are you putting me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. Then Jesus said to them, Whose head is this? Whose image? And whose title? They answered, The emperor's. Then he said to them, Give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperor's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard this, they were amazed, and they left him and went away. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the thoughts and meditations of all of our hearts and minds be offered to you this day. May they speak your word. May they enable us to hear your voice. And may they help us to live in the way of your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, this morning's reading from Matthew's Gospel brings up a subject that most of us know a little something about. Taxes. Something of a four-letter word in many households. You're probably familiar with Benjamin Franklin's statement that nothing in this world can be said to be certain except for death and taxes. But I particularly appreciate the words of Margaret Mitchell in her famous novel, Gone with the Wind. Death and taxes and childbirth. There's never a convenient time for any of them. Indeed, throughout history, many folks would agree with Ms. Mitchell. Remember those early Americans in Boston who had a little tea 
party. They were protesting against taxes. And the tax code can get pretty complicated. In 1986, Congress came up with a plan to simplify our tax code, and the plan itself was only 1,379 pages long. They had boiled it all down into a book longer than War and Peace or the Holy Bible. Taxes are almost always controversial, the subject of perpetual debate and discussion. So it is today, and so it was in Jesus' day. Some Pharisees and Herodians came up to Jesus to ask him a question about taxes. It sounded like a simple yes or no question. Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor? However, things were much, much more complicated. They were referring to the tax that the Judean people were required to pay to the Roman government. Every man over the age of 14 and every woman between 12 and 65 were to pay one denarius a year. One day's now, to most Pharisees and many other Judeans, this was an insult and an outrage. The Romans had invaded their home and stolen their land. They had robbed them and oppressed them, and now they had the gall to ask them to pay for the pleasure. And the very coin that they used to pay this tax, the denarius itself, also presented a problem for any faithful religious Jew. In plain contradiction of God's law, the coin contained a graven image of Tiberius Caesar. That broke one man. And it also proclaimed that Tiberius' father, Augustus, was divine. And that Tiberius was the son of God, breaking the commandment again. If you paid the tax, you had broken God's law, and you were a traitor to your people, as far as many were concerned. Meanwhile, the Herodians saw things differently. They were quite content to let Rome have their way, as long as they left them alone. Their argument was a very practical one. The Roman government didn't look kindly on people who refused to pay the tax. In fact, they were known to execute rabble-rousers who tried to convince people not to pay. Any who rebelled against paying it were likely to be crucified and left hanging on the cross for all to see. If you refused to pay the tax, you were considered guilty of treason. If you were risking death, you didn't pay. To pay or not to pay? That was the question. And it was a very tricky question. There was no right answer that would satisfy both the Pharisees and the Herodians. If Jesus said it was lawful to pay this tax, he would lose credibility with the people since it seemed to be arguing against God's law. But if Jesus said it was not lawful, to pay this tax. He would most likely lose his life since the Herodians would hurry to tell the Romans that here was another rebel to get rid of. As Admiral Akbar said in the movie Star Wars, it's trapped. <laughs> yeah. It was designed to discredit Jesus and embarrass him. They wish to put him in an impossible position. Jesus, though, turned the tables on them. He knew their intentions. He knew they were trying to trap him. And he would not let them force him into answering either yes or no. As he liked to do so often, he answered their question with a question of his own. He asked them to show him one of the coins used to pay the tax. And he wanted to know whose image was on that coin. Then, after they had replied that it was 
Caesar's image was engraved on that coin, he offered what we might call a tax code for disciples. If anyone would follow Jesus, they were to give Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give to God what belongs to God. Now what Jesus says here sounds simple enough, right? Figure out what belongs to Caesar and give him what he's due. Figure out what we owe God and then pay up. Yet this is a dangerous path to follow. Retired seminary professor Mark Allen Powell shares a legend about the conversion of the Gauls in Europe, an ancient people who lived in what is now France and Belgium. Eventually, they were conquered by the Roman Empire, and Christian missionaries flooded into their territory. And the story goes that when a Gallic warrior was baptized in a river or stream, he would hold one arm out of the water as the missionary dumped the rest of it under. And the missionaries thought that this was very strange until they learned the reason behind this practice. Whenever the next battle or war broke out, the warrior could cry out, This arm is not baptized. And then with that arm, he could grab his sword, his club, or his axe, and proceed to destroy his enemy in a flurry of violence that was decidedly non-Christian. Now this story is most likely apocryphal. Things most likely didn't happen that way back then. But that is not to say that something similar has not taken place throughout the history of the church. It happens even now. It happens when any of us want to withhold some part of our identity, some aspect of our lives from God. We make a mistake when we read Jesus' tax code as setting up two equal realms both of which are entitled to a share of all we have. It's not as if God and Caesar had an equal claim on us. We cannot say that we have been baptized, but our wallets and our bank accounts have not been. We cannot live as if our time at church and at home belongs to God, but our time at work belongs ultimately to our boss or our company. We cannot offer some of our allegiance to God while giving the rest of our allegiance to Washington, D.C., or Raleigh, or some political party. In the early days of Nazi Germany, Hitler and his government told the church that their most important duty was to the country. He said that their highest loyalty should be to the German race. And thank God, then, that there were Christians who stood up and spoke out against that message. In one of the documents in our Presbyterian Book of Confessions, called the Barman Declaration, was written during the time when the Nazis came to power in Germany. And it makes it abundantly clear what Christians then and Presbyterians now believe. It says... We reject the false doctrine as though there were other areas of our life in which we would not belong to Jesus Christ, but to other lords. Areas in which we would not need justification and sanctification. It's not so simple as figuring out what percentage belongs to God. Jesus asks whose image is on the cloth. It bears Caesar's image. Caesar made it. Caesar can claim that coin as his own. So what is it that bears the image of God? What is it that God has made? What is it that God can claim as his own? Well, every good and faithful Jew would know. Anyone familiar with the first chapter or two of the book of Genesis? We ourselves bear the image of God. God has made us. God has made everything that exists in the universe. So we belong to God. We belong to Jesus.
The mark of the cross has been traced upon our foreheads at baptism. The Roman tax code said that everyone owed to Caesar one denarius, one coin that bore the image of Caesar. Those of us who would follow Jesus Christ are bound by a different kind of code. That code states that we owe to God our very lives, our entire selves, everything that we have and everything that we are. As some have said, we are the coins of God. The late Dutch poet and priest Joseph Donders wrote that God coined us in God's image and we are God's money and we should be spent. Money should circulate, we should circulate. Money should go from hand to hand, we should go from hand to hand. Money should be used, we should be used. Money is going to be worn. We are going to be worn. We should be spent. We are coins. God is trying to use us to pay off our debts, to pay off the debts we owe each other here on earth. Let us risk being used, and we will be increased, and the end will be glory. Yes, Caesar would settle for a coin. The IRS would settle for cold, hard cash. But God will not be bought off with a few dollars. God will not be satisfied with a check, no matter how much it is written for. God wants us. God tells us. God wants all of us. All that we have, body, mind, soul, and bank account. It's all his creation. All of it truly belongs to him. Now let me be clear. I don't believe that this means we are to give every cent we have to the church. It does not, I think, mean that we must spend every waking moment in the church building or in prayer. Here's what I believe that it does mean. There's a story told of George Shultz, who served as Secretary of State under President Ronald Reagan, and part of his job was interviewing newly appointed ambassadors before they went out to serve overseas. He liked to give them a little test at the conclusion of the interview, and he would show them a globe and ask them to prove to him that they could identify their country. Well, the new appointees would spin the globe and plop their fingers down on their assigned country. Once, however, an old friend and a former senator was appointed as the ambassador to Japan. And so when he was interviewed by Schultz, he was asked to go to the globe and point out his country. And the senator walked over to the globe, spun it around, and he put his finger down squarely on the United States. That is my country, he said. After that, Schultz continued to give all the new ambassadors his test, but he told that story to every new appointee who came through his office. You're over there in that country, he told them, but never forget who your country really is. You see, sometimes we will need to go and spend time in another country. Sometimes it would be necessary to devote our energy to other things. Sometimes in order to live in this world, we pay a tax to Caesar. But followers of Jesus are never to forget who our ruler truly is. We're never to forget that our true allegiance is to God. We're never to forget that our highest priority is to glorify God in all that we say and do. As we will hear next week, our chief priority is to love God with all of our being and to love our neighbors as ourselves. Even though we live in the world of the here and now, our true country is the kingdom of heaven. Loving God, following Jesus comes first. And when that comes first, we find that something remarkable happens. 
Imagine that your life is a tall, somewhat narrow glass container. You have a jar full of uncooked rice. You have some marbles and you have some large rocks. Now, if you try to put the rice in the jar first, the marbles second, and the large rocks in last, they won't fit. There just won't be enough room for it all. But if you put the large rocks in first, then the marbles, and finally the rice, everything fits. Now imagine that God is the largest of those rocks. The marbles and the rice are some of the other demands on our lives, our jobs, our families, our friends, our needs. But maybe it'd be better to show you than tell you. Another of our confessions, the Heidelberg Catechism, states that we belong, body and soul, in life and in death, to our faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. All that we have and all that we are, we owe to God. And When we render to God all that belongs to God, when loving God is our highest priority, when serving Jesus comes first in our lives, we find that everything else fits. Everything else finds its place. Only as we love God best can we love everything and everyone else rightly. Only when we give to God the things of God are we able to give properly to Caesar. Now that is a code for all disciples to live by. Simple enough to offer us a way to live faithfully in the very complex realities of our day. May we do so in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Please join with me in the reading of our prayer of confession. How quick we are to say yes to you, O Lord, and then we turn around and forget our bold words of commitment. We really want to serve, but we are very weak and are easily drawn away by cares and fears. We pledge ourselves to work for your kingdom, but find ourselves pulled this way and that by other demands on our time and energy. Forgive us, O oh Lord, when we so quickly drop our commitments to serving you. Heal our spirits and give us the bold courage to truly be your disciples. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our assurance of pardon. God, God knows our hearts and our spirits. God sees our struggles and forgives our weaknesses. Know that it is in God's healing love that you live and move and have your being. Rejoice, for God is with you always. Amen. Our offertory hymn is number 688, We Give Thee But Thy Name. are and all that we have is a gift from your gracious hand, O God, and with joy for your presence and gratitude for your grace. We bring our tithes and offerings, thankful for the privilege of working in your fields. We ask you would bring an abundant harvest for your kingdom. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 